Hello, and welcome back to chapter 9. In the beginning of chapter 9, we looked at the outline of a uh, hypothesis test where we were testing a claim. Today, we're going to look at a very specific hypothesis test, which is your next inference test. And this inference test name is a one proportion Z test. So let's recall our basketball player, that was me, who claimed to be an 80% free throw shooter. And in our simple random sample of 50 free throws, I made 32 of them. So my sample proportion or P hat was 0.64, which was much lower than what we claimed. The question is, does it provide convincing evidence against the original claim? Now we did simulations in our last section, but now we're gonna actually do a full inference test here. So our hypothesis was that P is equal to 0.8, and then you guys said, no, Mr. Walsh, you're no good at basketball. So the proportion was less than 0.8. But that was our, out, our alternative hypothesis, where P is the actual proportion of free throws that the shooter makes in a long run. Okay. When we are looking at uh, testing a hypothesis, we are doing an inference test for a significance test. And when we carry out a significance test, we're looking to estimate an unknown population parameter, in this case, a proportion. So we're looking at a sampling distribution. And when we're analyzing a sampling distribution, we have to check three important conditions. Condition number one, it must come from a random sample or a well-designed random experiments. So our data has to essentially be properly gathered. If we are sampling without replacement, we must make sure that we are uh, sampling from a very large population. How large? Well, our sample needs to be 10% or less than the entire population. So that's our 10% rule to assume independence. And then large counts. We need our sampling distribution to be approximately normal. In order for that to happen, you have n times p, n times 1 minus p. Now on the screen, you'll see a little circle next to p. We call that p naught. Okay, why is it p naught? Because this P naught is our null hypothesis, which is H naught. Right? And so we're our, we are assuming that the sampling distribution comes from the, uh, is, is shaped around the population parameter. And we are assuming the population parameter is actually P. So our null hypothesis we are going to assume is true. And that's why it's P naught. Okay, so here, uh, if H naught is true, so if our null hypothesis is true, then the sampling distribution will look like this. It will have a center of 0.8. It'll have a standard deviation of 0 0.0566 because that would be the square root of P times one minus P over N. Okay, we're no longer looking at P hat because we're, th we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true. We always assume that it is true until we can prove otherwise. And over here, way over here, is our p hat of 0.64. Okay, very far from the center. Okay, the question is, how far from the center is it? How far away is our p hat value of 0.64 from our actual parameter 0.8? So, how many standard deviations away am I from the center? Well, we know how to find that. Think back to the chapter two when we talked about the Z scores. In the original Z score used to be Z score is X minus X bar over Sigma. Remember that from chapter two, it was really just the, uh, the value minus the mean over the standard deviation. That was, this is all from chapter two. Okay. And we have these things, right? But they're not X and X bar and Sigma. We have this P hat, and then this is our parameter P. So this is really our mean, right? Cause that's the center of our sampling distribution. So we wanna know how far is 0.64 from 0.8 divided by the standard deviation, which is the square roots of 0.8 times 0.2 over 50. This is the same thing as this, except we're looking at a sampling distribution 
and not a distribution of a population or a distribution of a sample. Okay, it's the value minus the parameter over the standard deviation. So how far is our p hat from, from point eight? Well, this is called a test statistic. Okay, we, we, we know it as a z-score, but our test statistic tells you how many standard deviations away we are from the mean. It's not always going to be a z-score because in our next distribution, it'll eventually be a t-score. Okay, but it tells you how far away, we, how many standard deviations away we are from the mean. It standardizes our, uh, our p-hat. So it's the statistic minus the parameter over the standard deviation of the statistic or of the sampling distribution. Okay, so in our particular uh, example, we get a z-score or a test statistic of negative 2.83. The reason why it's negative is because it's below the parameter 0.8. So uh, using table A, which we're never ever, ever going to use, uh, we would uh, instead we would use normal CDF, where we're looking for the area below the p hat value of 0 0.064. So in normal CDF, it would be lower bound negative infinity, upper bound negative 2.83. The mean is 0 0.8, and standard deviation is that 0 0.0566 number. And it would give you a, a p-value of 0 0.0023. It's the p-value, right? We talked about this last time. It is the probability of getting the result that we got given that the parameter is true, given that the null hypothesis is true. So the probability of me shooting and making 64% of my 50 free throws, given that I'm actually an 80% free throw shooter, is 0.23%. Very small. Two in a thousand chance, okay? In our calculators, how do we find this p-value without having to do normal CDF? Well, let's show you. Okay, so we can do every inference test in our calculator, and I strongly suggest that you use the calculator. Don't try to do this by hand. So in our calculators, we've already learned how to do a one proportion Z interval, and we've already learned how to do a one sample t interval so now we're going to go back into our stat go over to test and we're going to learn a new test here okay it's a one prop z test this guy right here one prop z test when you click this it's going to ask you for some inputs p naught p naught is your null hypothesis so 0.8 x is the number of successes that we had which is 32 n is our sample size which is 50 and then they're going to ask for what side of the hypothesis, what's our alternative hypothesis? Is it not equal to, is it less than, is it greater than? And because you guys think that I shoot and make less than 80% of my free throws, it's going to be less than P naught, P naught being the null hypothesis. Okay, and we're going to calculate. And when we do, we get the z-score, our test statistic. We get our p-value of 0.00234 and our p hat 0.64 and n is 50. Your calculator can do all this for you. You don't have to actually do it by hand. You don't have to use normal CDF. But that, that's where those values are coming from. Okay. Remember, once we get our p value, we want to draw a conclusion by comparing it to alpha. So when we go through an entire test, a one proportion z test, this is how it should look. First, you're going to state your hypotheses. Your, your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis and at what significance level. You must name your alpha, okay? And define any parameters that you're going to use. In your planning section, you're gonna choose the appropriate test. Whether, so right now we have three different types of inference methods. We have a one proportion Z interval, a one sample T interval, and now our newest test, a one proportion Z test. You're gonna check all three conditions if the conditions are met, you're going to actually do the calculations. You do not need to show me how you got these values by hand. All you have to do is tell me what the test statistic is, which is a z-score here, and what your p-value is. In your conclusion, you want to do two things. You want to compare p to alpha and then make a decision in context. So compare p to alpha, 
and I make a decision in context. All right? Um, this is just talking about the conditions. Nothing super important. All right. So one proportion Z test. All right. When you're doing a one proportion Z test, we can look at a one-sided test or a two-sided test. So far, we've been looking at the same uh, uh, sort of problem the whole time, which is the basketball problem. And we've been looking at a one-sided test. So we've been looking at the middle one here where our alternative was that it was less than our null hypothesis. So we're looking at the left tail, okay? If the alternative was not equal to, we'd be looking at both tails because we would care about uh, what's happening on the uh, on both ends because we just, all we care about is if the uh, null hypothesis is incorrect, okay? The p-value in a one-sided tail is the area in the one tail of the normal curve. Okay, so if we're looking for one side, then the p-value is in that one side of the tail. In a two-sided test, the alternative hypothesis has the form p is not equal to p naught. Right? This is the this is a two-sided test because we're looking at both tails. When we do that, the p-value in this uh, test is the probability of getting a sample proportion as far from p naught in either direction. Okay, so if I went out and I shot and made 98% of my free throws, in our example, that wouldn't be statistically significant because you only care about the one tail. If you were doing a two-sided test, that would probably come up to be statistically significant because 0.98 is so much bigger than 0.8. Okay, as a result of this two-sided test, you have to find the area in both tails of a standard normal distribution to get the p-value. Okay, because the p-value is the probability of getting an event uh, as extreme as the one that you got, given that the null hypothesis is true. So let's look at an example. According to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, aka the CDC, which everyone knows what the CDC is now, we're in the middle of a pandemic, 50% uh, of high school students have never smoked a cigarette. Tayon wonders whether this national result holds true in his large urban school. For his AP Stack project, Tayon surveys a simple random sample of 150 kids from his school. He gets responses from all 150. 90 say that they have never smoked a cigarette. What should Tayon conclude? So let's go ahead and do an inference test to make a conclusion for Tayon. Okay. Number one, our statement. Because the... CDC says 50% of uh, high school students have never smoked a cigarette. We are going to assume that the, po the population parameter P is equal to 0.5. So our null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0.5, where P is a proportion of all students in Taeyeon school who would say they have never smoked a cigarette. Our alternative is just not 0.5. Because we, Tyron, has, Tyron has, just wants to know, is 0.5 correct? He doesn't care about uh, whether it's less than or greater than. Because they don't give us an alpha level, a significance level, if they don't give it to you in the problem, you can choose one. The most common one uses 0.05. So you have to state it. We will use an alpha level of 0.05. So here's our statement. We have our null hypotheses in terms of a parameter, and we have defined our parameter in this sentence right here and then we chose an alpha level. That's our statement. In our planning section, assuming that all the conditions are met, we will do a one proportion Z test. So I name the test I'm going to do up here. Then I'm gonna check all three conditions. Is it random? Yes, Tyon did a simple random sample of 150 students. We are going to assume that in his large high school, there are more than 1,500 students because that means that the 10% rule well, uh, condition is upheld. Then, assuming that uh, P is actually equal to 0.5, is our sampling distribution approximately normal? Let's check. In order for that to, ha to occur, we need N times P naught and N times 1 minus P naught to be greater than 10. Since they're both 75, they're both bigger than 10, so we are safe to do normal calculations because the sampling distribution is going to be approximately normal.
This is our planning statement. Okay, again, your answers are going to look more like essays than they are actual math problems. In the do section, all we need is our test statistic and our p-value. So let's go ahead and do that in our calculators. So here's my calculator. Let's clear this test. Let's go to test, a one prop z test. We think p is 0.5. Our X was 90, because 90 out of the 150 kids that he sampled said they never smoked a cigarette. And our, our alternative hypothesis is not equal to. When we calculate this, we get a Z score of 2.45, a P value of 0 0.014, and a P hat of 0 0.6, and N is 150. Okay? The important values are our test statistic and our p-value. Now, why is this p-value 0 0.014? Let's take a look. What we found is we were looking at a sampling distribution where the center was 0 0.5. And our p-hat value that we looked at was 0 0.6. So here, let's just say here is 0 0.6. That's the p-hat we looked at. That is 90 over 150. Now, this tail over here alone is not 0 0.014. Right? This p-value comes from looking at both sides. So looking at, a, the, looking at this side, this p-value, this, this value over here, the area under this curve, is actually only half of 0 0.014 because the other half is over here, this area. So what they did was they looked at the, the z-score up here, which would be whatever this z-score is, which we found to be 2.45. So they looked at the probability of getting a z-score above 2.45 and the probability of getting a z-score below negative 2.45. So they, the calculator was doing this calculations. Normal CDF, they were doing 2.45 to something big, mean zero, standard deviation one. We're talking about z-scores here. And they were taking this and multiplying it by two. And the reason why they're multiplying it by two is because it's a two-sided test. Our alternative hypothesis was not equal to. So even though we got this p hat right here, we weren't just looking at this tail, we were looking at both tails. Because it was a two-sided inference test. Okay, so again, all you need is your test statistic and your p-value, so 2.45, and our p-value of 0 0.014. That was your do section. In their conclusion, you have to compare p to alpha. So because our p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis, right? When p is small, we reject the null. So because our p-value is less than 0 0.014, oh, sorry, is less than 0 0.05, we will reject the null hypothesis. Now we gotta put it in context. We have convincing evidence that the proportion of all students at Taeyeon School would say that they have never smoked differs from the national result of 0.5. Notice how I say we have convincing evidence. I'm not saying for fact we know this is true. I'm just saying that we have really strong evidence that this is true. Okay, so we have strong evidence that the uh, alternative is true. This is us rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay. Now, sometimes confidence intervals can give us more information than an actual significance test. A significance test is basically a decision to either reject the null or fail to reject the null. If we reject the null hypothesis, we are left wondering what the actual proportion might be. Right. So in our last example, we just rejected 0.5. So now we're back to square one. Well, well what is the proportion? So instead of actually doing a hypothesis test, sometimes it's easier or more um, 
more uh, useful if we did a confidence interval. So instead, let's say we did a confidence interval in Taeyeon's example. Okay. Our confidence interval would be 0.522 to 0.678. Now this gives us an interval where there are plausible values that we can choose from. So we're 95% confident that the interval captures a true portion of students at Taeyeon School who would say that they have never smoked a cigarette. So this uh, confidence interval actually gives us a little bit better of an idea of what that proportion is, whereas the inference test just told us that it's probably not 0.5. And that's all it told us. It didn't tell us what it could be. It just told us that it probably isn't 0.5. Now, there is a connection between confidence intervals and two-sided tests. So a 95% confidence interval would give you a range of plausible proportions that would not be rejected by a two-sided test at an alpha level of 0.05. So the significance level 0.05 and a confidence level of 0.95 go hand in hand. Okay, they're complements of one another. This is only true for a two-sided test. Okay, so a two-sided test at a significance level, let's say 0.05, and a confidence level of let's say 95%, gives very similar information. If we have a 95% confidence interval, any value, oh, any value in that interval would not be rejected by a two-sided test. For example, if we go back to this example here, we had an interval of 0.522 to 0.678. Any null hypothesis outside of that range, outside of this interval, would have been rejected at an alpha level of 0 0.05. Any null hypothesis in this confidence interval would have been failed to reject at an alpha level of 0 0.05 because we have created a 95% confidence interval. So any, any hypothesis that is in this interval actually would have been failed to reject. Since 0.5 is not in this interval, it's not a plausible proportion, and therefore uh, it, is, it is rejected at a two-sided test, an alpha level of 0 0.05. This is only true for two-sided tests, not one-sided tests, because one-sided tests are a little different. All right, I'll be back for more in a little bit, because there is a part two here.